Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society. Bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love, alongside my co-hosts, Shamika Michelle and Wilfred Riley. And our guest this week is Mark Krikorian. He is the Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, it's the, obviously, it, it, it wasn't intentional, but it fell this way. It's Cinco de Mayo. So what better day to co- talk about how Mexico is not sending their best and how they are sending, oh, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is, you know, uh, an interesting and important topic. We talk about immigration. Um, we've talked before, you and I, and this has been at some point a hot button issue. And we can talk about why it's not now, because somehow everything just rotates away. It's the most important thing, then we don't care. Ukraine, then we don't care. Abortion, then we don't care. Before a while, immigration was the thing. There were, you know, mass groups at the border coming in every day. Back in Obama, they were coming on trains. Then, then they were being mistreated by ICE um, agents on horses. We can talk about all that. But now we're not talking about it in the media, but I assume it's still a problem, Mark. So first, let's start off before we get into the immigration problem with you letting us know what's going on today. Where are we now as far as uh, immigration is concerned? What's the uh, current climate of, at the border? Well, I mean, it's worse, worse at the border now than it was when it was in the news more, like you said. Uh, you know, last um, in March, more than 200,000 uh, illegal immigrants were apprehended, or the PC term is encountered, at the border. And for last month, the numbers aren't out yet, but preliminarily it looks like it's about the same, maybe a little higher, 200 plus thousand. You know, we're talking uh, 2 million apprehensions during this fiscal year, you know, through September. And that's, you know, unprecedented. And what's more, half of those people are being released into the United States in one way or another. I mean, since the beginning of the Biden administration, so, you know, starting with February, because they don't break it out by week, but starting with February of last year through now, the Biden administration has released into the United States probably more than one million illegal immigrants, you know, with the idea that they're going to turn themselves in and they're going to apply for asylum some of them will, some of them will show up for hearings, but if they're turned down, none of them are leaving. So this really is uh, basically a doubling of immigration, because legal immigration, actual immigration, is about a million plus a year, number, number of green cards that we give out. So this is basically the Biden administration running this parallel immigration system of letting in about the same number of people, but outside the uh, limits that Congress has set. So it's it's pretty bad. And I got to say, it's going to be back in the news. It never goes away. It may go away a little bit. In a sense, it is kind of like abortion or foreign policy. It'll flare up. But after a while, reporters kind of lose interest. I mean, they're looking for the newest thing. It's, it's not even really a, I don't think, a political bias thing, although obviously the media is mainly biased uh, leftward. But it really is, I think, more just a matter of what's new, what's different, and what's the current thing. But immigration is going to be back in the news in a big way. I can pretty much guarantee that. Um, I definitely believe that. I got a naive question, but I know everybody who's watching and listening may not, you know, have the answers to all this, and we have enough time to kind of unpack this. You mentioned that they're releasing them with the expectation that they'll apply for asylum or they'll do this or they'll leave or what are they applying for asylum from? Well, supposedly persecution. Um, you know, no. the law says you apply for that you can get asylum if you have pers- been persecuted or fear persecution based on five grounds. Four of them are obvious: race, religion, nationality, political opinion. You can still activists can play games with those things, but they're pretty obvious. The fifth one is this loophole catch-all category called 
persecution based on membership in a particular social group which basically means anything a judge wants it to mean. And so this administration has been expanding what that social group thing means beyond anything Congress ever intended. And um, so there's a kind of initial plausibility to these asylum claims. But frankly, even once they pass the first hurdle of, it's called a credible fear interview, just to screen out the people who are, nut jobs or think that, you know, Mickey Mouse is talking to them through their dental work, that sort of thing. Almost everybody else passes that first hurdle. But a bunch of people, if they follow through, don't get asylum uh, because they don't end up actually qualifying. Nonetheless, they've been here for one year, two years, three years. They may have had a kid while they were waiting. Uh, And under this administration, nobody's going to make them leave, even if they lose. So, it's the the whole asylum thing is kind of a pretext to get past the border patrol at which point you are de facto home free even if you don't actually have you know a a green card that would allow you to eventually become a citizen most of these folks they don't care about being a citizen they just want to be able to work and send money home and um the biden administration is basically facilitating that and making it uh making it possible for the, for the ones that want to work. Shamika, um, do you have any um, questions or any comments you want to make about the current state of immigration, like the issues that we're facing now? I guess I want to know, I saw a report that there are a lot of them dying around the border. I saw something that said, you know, as if they were trying to blame the fact that the wall is too high. I thought that was the point, but they are saying the wall is too high. And so people are finding dead immigrants in their yard or just a lot of uh, immigrants around the border that are dying. So are those reports accurate? Well, some of it's true. There's no question that immigrants do, in fact, people trying to get here do die in various points along the way. It could be in Panama going through the jungle, or it could be climbing off, you know, climbing, trying to climb over the fence and they fall off, uh, fall down the other side. But, you know, I mean, the fence is right there. You know that it's 30 feet high. You're, t- you know, you sort of, uh, you buy your ticket and you take your chances. I mean, what, what does somebody think is going to happen if you climb up a ladder 30 feet high on a wall and then jump off the other side? Um, it's kind of like a crook breaking into your house and he falls through the skylight and then sues you. So, uh, yes, there's no question that people do um, suffer harm. Some of them die on the way. But our responsibility or our, the part of our responsibility for that is that we're kind of incentivizing people to take these risks. Obviously, if we do everything to dissuade people from climbing over the fence and then, you know, falling off the other side. If we have real enforcement inside the country, if we don't just let people go, some people are still going to try, and that's totally on them. But what we're doing is kind of almost luring people, creating an incentive to take these kind of risks, whether it's, you know, risking your life with a a ruthless smuggler who may end up raping or killing you, or you're, you know, going through this trackless jungle in Panama and you get killed – uh, or you die it's somehow crossing the border, uh, we do have a some partial responsibility for that precisely because we're sending mixed messages. We're saying we kind of want to make it a little bit hard to get here, but if you get across, you have a pretty good chance of being let go. Well, people are going to you know take you up on that risk. If you reduce the incentive, fewer people are going to take those risks, and then – you know, it's not really on us. It's on the people taking these foolish risks to begin with. Well, I want to get to what these incentives are, but first I want to hear what uh, Will has to say. Uh, Will, go ahead. Yeah, hey, let me... <laughs> okay, so the mic's on now. Yeah, one of the things that always interests me about this issue, Mark, is that offhand, I'm not sure why illegal immigration is a controversial issue at all. Um, I mean, the general idea in most civilized societies is that you have certain laws, which most, if not all, the population agrees on. 
and you expect the law enforcement agencies to enforce those. So, I mean, virtually every argument that you could make about illegal immigration or in favor of individual illegal immigrants, you could also make about the local weed man. Like, he's a nice guy, just wanted to live a better life, so on down the line. I mean, everyone wants that, but you can't generally achieve that by breaking the law, or at least, since I know a lot of people that did, you take the risks that go along with that choice. So, I mean, when you say, and I, I think this is true, but when you say that, The Biden administration, and we've seen, I just pulled up the data on my computer, we've seen about a 460% increase in illegal immigration. Mark might vet that a little bit, but it's about that. What, I guess my question for you would be, what's the logic, what's the framework of activist groups or whatever that led us to saying things like, well, we're not going to build a wall or we're not just going to turn back people at the border? I mean, the... It's generally known among people with a diverse friend group in a large city that very many asylum claims, probably most, are fake. There, There's not a war going on in, for example, Mexico or Poland or even Guatemala. I mean, so what? what's the incentive network that led us to pretend that economic illegal migrants are refugees and that we have some sort of moral duty to admit huge numbers of them into the country? I grew up in a working class, white, black, Spanish neighborhood, and nobody thought this. And it's something that has begun, that's become part of the discourse since sort of the Cesar Chavez 70s, and there's a lot of hostility toward illegal migration to today. So how did, how did that happen as one of the experts on this? The... Um I think the basic reason you have this widespread, honestly, support for illegal immigration, or at least not opposition to it from certain quarters, is that uh, large parts of the left, now the mainstream left, and also the libertarian-oriented right, don't think that limits on immigration are morally legitimate. In other words, the United States, the American people, through their elected officials, don't have the right to say no to anybody unless he's you know got a nuclear suitcase bomb in his hand or something like that or ebola coming out of his ears other than that they genuinely don't believe that it's morally defensible to say no to anybody in other words they're in favor of unlimited immigration not necessarily open borders some of them will still be okay with checking people at uh, you know entry points but unlimited immigration and so if the law says immigration is limited and most people actually think that's what it should be those people who don't believe that end up making excuses for illegal immigration because the point is people have to be able to move here by any means possible and if refugee or asylum law is one of the things that makes that possible then so be it the main thing is People have to be able to get into the United States, no matter what, regardless of limits or other rules. And, you know, that that you end up with the situation we're dealing with now. I want to say something about what Will said. Will said that he doesn't understand why this is a controversial topic. (laughs) And and I'd say that I don't know if it is. I mean, it's become that. But I'm thinking of the way most people think. And I know it is for elites and for journalists and for politicians. But whatever your views on like abortion, I think people honestly have, they are diametrically opposed on that issue and it's a hot button issue. On some areas of crime, they have different views on what to do and, they, and they're rapidly against each other. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I know there's an elite class that thinks that way. And I wanna ask what Shamika thinks about this because you know normally Shamika's my, you know I go to for the real answer and for keeping it naked and knowing, well, and knowing what I thought uh, the post of the black community, but recently she tweeted something about Tesla and drug dealers. And I, and I was told that she don't really know any black people, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I know a couple black folks and I think that Shamika does and will does. And none of the people that I know think this is a controversy, right? None of them are saying, well, I think everybody should be able to come here no matter what. I don't know anybody says that. And, And I'm talking, really in many cases liberal people but they're like no that makes no sense of course you should vet people of course you get to pick which people come of course you can set limits right of course we don't want all those people here right so i don't know if this unlike some of these other hot button issues are is really 
so splitting the country in half or is it just the people with the power and the microphones are saying that the majority of americans want everybody to be able to come in shamika what do you think i don't know i think a lot of people are not paying attention and they don't realize the effect that it could actually have on america and the economy Mm -hmm. because i don't see as many people you know, that I talk to or around here that actually complain. And I know since about 1997, when I had one, you know, I was in the left turning lane and they were supposed to be going straight. And instead of going uh, straight, they turned and hit my car and then they didn't have any insurance. So I have been on this send them back to where they came from for a very long time and i just don't seem like it just doesn't seem like it's being echoed where i'm from in my community they are like roaches they don't die they multiply and you know yeah but yeah what i'm saying is so so people may be blind to it and they may not be saying it but what i'm saying is they're not out there like we see these 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 radicals of these activists saying we should have more immigration we should have no limits they're just not saying anything at all right right but but what we see in the news is like everybody wants to pick up a picket sign everybody wants to take an illegal and put them in the in the in the basement yeah. like i don't know where these people are but will you were going to say something yeah i well i think yeah the, i just left the mic off but I, I think one of the this is true that's actually a very good point charles and this is true i think for a lot of issues one of the things that I have to remind myself to do is not be sort of painfully online because I have my, like, I've literally used to co-own a social media company. I have a Twitter account. We all have a great number of followers on Twitter. I think Shamika's is significantly ahead of me. But, I mean, there's there's that world where you're engaging on the Internet. You're arguing with someone who's like a professor of women's studies at Brandeis. And then there's reality. You know, even Facebook is more real than that. But so there, there's hyper online Twitter, the gram, your, your scholarly disciplines page. And I think that's where a lot of these issues are being discussed, because these are the issues that are going to be mainstream issues. Should we have borders? Trans kids is one that comes to mind in 10 or 15 years. Right now, the, uh, the ordinary citizen, of course, doesn't believe this. I mean, I actually I thought about Mark's comment that there's. Many people feel there's not a moral, within this group we're discussing, feel there's not a moral argument that immigration can be limited. And that that strikes me as just, again, objectively insane. Like, first, you know, amoral aggression is more important than conventional morality for a leader, frankly. So the idea that you could let an unlimited number of people that perform below the average for the citizenry into your country, it's a no. You have to stop it. You can't allow someone to be in a leadership role that thinks that. But even morally, I mean, virtually every conventional moral code I can think of, one of the most significant duties is to your own group first, to your family, to your nation. What's it going to do to black or poor white unemployment to allow mass illegal migration? So this, I I don't think that this is a very good argument, and I don't think it's a very widely shared argument, but you guys are right that it's one of the things that's being discussed in elite spaces now. And the question with a lot of this stuff, including the the trans kids position, for example, or the idea of disarming the citizenry, I really, I'm not a conspiracy head, but my question is, what's the goal here? And I I can't think of a positive answer to that. Well, I mean, in other words, I don't know if there's actually a specific goal. I think it's a worldview issue. Like you said, that most conceptions of the responsibility of a citizen or, or an elected official is that you take care of your own people first and then others. I mean, St. Paul wrote something to that effect that, you know, a person who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever. Um, The fact is that that section of our leadership class that doesn't believe in borders, they don't see immigrants as other or Americans as somebody they have a responsibility for. I remember, and this isn't just left-wingers. I remember... I gave a talk years ago at the Council on Foreign Relations, and there was a member, a CFR member, who was, I think he was a vice president at Citibank or something like that. And he was at the talk, and I talked to him afterwards, and he said, you know, a lot of the points you made are, you know, sound. I guess that makes sense, sure. But I don't have any more responsibility to somebody in South Central than I do to somebody in, you know, Montevideo or Jakarta. That's the perspective, and that's, I don't, there's no real... There's no really resolving that. I mean, that's a fundamental worldview issue. These are people who are post-American, uh, to put it most charitably. Some of them are, 
anti-American, you know, Jane Fonda types, but most of them aren't. They don't hate America. They just move beyond America. They're citizens of the world. And so why would they distinguish between somebody from Guatemala uh, and somebody from Kentucky uh, when it comes to the best interests of that person? That's actually a very fascinating point. What do you see as your in-group? So for me, it would be an American is probably actually my first identifier, but I'm a black man. I'm an American right now. I probably would idea as a Kentuckian. There are groups of people around me that I I see on a regular basis. If your group, if your primary in-group identifier is the world or humanity, that may be noble at some level. But People need to understand you're capable of a lot in terms of trying to equalize things within that group. Yeah. But I mean, and, you know, when you make the point that, look, letting this person in, Say, um, you know, uh, a uh, Guatemalan Highlander with a third grade education. Perfectly take all any crime issue, any of that stuff. They're normal people. They're just working. And if you sort of think about prosperity worldwide as sort of one to ten, if that Guatemalan immigrant comes here and coming here brings him, say, from a three to a six, if that causes an American to become poorer, to go from a six to a five or a seven to a six, they're okay with that uh, because they don't see, like you said, they don't see that American who's suffering, whether he's white or black or any, or Hispanic or an earlier immigrant. They don't see that person as having any greater claim on their moral um, uh, considerations than the newcomer from somewhere else. You know, I, I thought about what you said uh, I mean, we spoke several months ago, but it came back up because I had a couple guests on the show, wrote a book, Dear White Women. They're both uh, Japanese Americans. You know, I think each, each of them had one parent who was a Japanese immigrant. And so they, we were having this discussion about Asian hate and all this stuff. And, you know, totally fine. And, you know, you know, I'm thinking about the whole thing, I, I, analyzing everything they say. And one of them threw something out there. Probably, you know, not just trying to explain history, right? And I and, and I thought about it. I thought about what you were saying. And what she said was, and we can, we're we going to talk about solutions, what we should do from a policy standpoint. And I know people, uh, there's a point of contention with HB1 visas and who, who we choose to come here and how many and that kind of thing. But she's talking about, you know, immigration traditionally as it goes through. And she's talking about, you know, discrimination, racism. And then as an aside, to prove a point, she says like, yes, so we had Asian Americans who had been immigrating here for a while, but it, you gotta understand, it wasn't just every you know Asian, they only allowed the Asians in, they wanted in, they were picking which ones they were, so some Asians couldn't come because it was, you know, they wanted them to be like maybe somebody who they thought would assimilate. They wanted them to be middle class where they were, they wanted them to be educated. Like, but she wasn't saying it like it was a good thing, right? She was saying right. it as if to say, who's, who is America to decide which immigrants they want to come in? And I was, I'm thinking like, um, shouldn't they be able to? I mean, the answer is the, no, I mean, the they world, don't think so. Because, you're right, because six billion can't come. So if we, say, if we draw the line and we compromise and we draw the line at a hundred million, you talked about a million legal, a mil- million illegal. We decide a hundred million can come in. When we say 100 million can come in, I can tell you right now, 200 million want to come in. Right. That number will go up. So you still have to decide which ones come. But to, to hear her, hear you talk and then to hear her say, well, yeah, they let us in, but then they just got to pick and choose which people they could let in. What's up with that? I mean, how else do you do it? I mean, they were also picking which Eastern uh, European immigrants came in. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, when I ask people like this sometimes, okay, you want to let in. Let's say you want to double immigration, 2 million people a year legally. I'm like, okay, that's a position. What are you willing to do to t- Mr. 2 million and 1? Let's say he's not a criminal, it's nothing, he's just a regular guy. Mm. Are you willing to track him down, take him into custody, and throw him out? Yes or no? And if you're not, then you're for unlimited immigration. And, and this administration just isn't willing to do that, isn't willing to enforce the rules <coughs> the number <coughs> the number of people being deported from inside the country has collapsed under biden some people are still deported but the number even the number of criminals being deported is down so if you're not willing to follow through on the limits that exist in the law then you're not for those limits you're just you're for unlimited immigration 
I said I was going to get back to to, to uh, what the incentives were and let you explain that, but you just said something that's fascinating to me that I, that I truly don't get. You know, some people say I don't understand. No, I really don't understand. You don't want an immigration. We're you know there are no borders. To, we're, we're the government of the world, all that kind of stuff. But the criminals, why don't they want to put the, put the criminals out? So well, you're here illegally. You we called you a couple times. You've gone through the criminal justice system. You stabbed seven people. Why do you get to stay? Because they don't think anybody should be deported. It's not that they're saying. But, so are these no, the same people that don't want them in jail either? No, I mean, you've got to do something with them. Maybe but also, the criminal justice is too big and costs too much money. Well, maybe it would be cheaper if you let somebody else hold them in their jail in Costa Rica. I mean, maybe there's, there's probably some overlap. But, I mean, look at it. If I look at it in the most kind of, I guess, charitable sense, a lot of these folks, they're saying, okay, the person should serve his time in prison. Whatever that is, that's fine. But, Three weeks. but when he's finished, he shouldn't be made to leave. He's he paid his debt to society, as they say. He should be able to stay. I mean, there's a mainstream group. It's the um, the day laborers, National Day Laborers Organizing Network, I think it's called. I mean, it's pretty hard left, but on the Democrat side, it's mainstream. They've had a hashtag campaign, and they still believe in this, that says not one more. In other words, not one more person should be deported. Literally no one should be deported, even if they're criminals. Now, the criminals serve their time, then they get out, they should be able to stay. That is what they believe, because, you know, we don't have the right to say no to anybody. If they're already here, they get to stay. But they don't have a skill set, so they're going to stab somebody else. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> uh... <laughs> no, no, that's no maybe. No, yeah. no. <laughs> they're going to stay. Okay, they're going to shoot them. But, I mean, let's even <laughs> say that doesn't happen. Let's say they do... You know, they're not recidivist criminals. It doesn't matter. They're not supposed to be here. They need to be thrown out. But the point is they don't think anyone should be made to leave. They're not one more. Shemika, what were you about to say? I Excessive agree with morality is a mental more. virus. <laughs> yeah. Just not one more to come in. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. I agree with the sentiment. <laughs> yeah, they're thinking the other way around. They're not one right. more wants to be thrown out. But absolutely. So, uh Anyway, Will, uh, were you were you done, Will? Because I was going to ask you something, but you were going to say no. I mean, like one, the the sentiment is basically what I said. But I mean, excessive philosophy might be a better word than morality is not only a waste of time; it's actually damaging to human societies. When people start sitting in college salons, smoking clove cigarettes, and thinking about Marxism, I mean, the impact is almost never positive. That basic common sense that you need as any kind of competent leader, like, no, we don't need more working men here in a country of three. I mean, the idea that this is not likely to be positive. We don't need criminal illegal aliens. I mean, that sort of thing is almost always accurate, I think, at a certain level. When you start thinking about whether you have some sort of abstract moral duty to people that are illegally entering your country and then committing crimes, I mean, you're in a weird theoretical dorm room world that's not going to produce anything positive. Yeah, unfortunately, though, um, what that highlights is that immigration is less a right-left thing than it is an up-down thing. It really is more a leadership class you know, overeducated folks who smoked, I guess, clove cigarettes. I've never smoked With the chapeau, you saw me put yeah. my French hat um, <laughs> on. the one hand, and then kind of regular folks on the other, whatever those regular folks think about taxes or abortion or anything else. So it's another way. And you see the same thing in Europe. There's this elite versus public split on these issues of national identity, national, the national question, some people call it. So it's immigration borders, sovereignty, you know, that's what Brexit was about in the UK. Um, that split between normal people and leadership class is real, and immigration is one of the places you see it most obviously. Well, I want to talk about a shift. You know, I talk about uh, uh, the culture a lot, and I'm saying it's dr dramatically shifted, even though some people uh, don't want to admit it. Shout out to Colin Wright. Um, but um, the uh, I want to talk about that and how we got here briefly. And so I want to go to Will because Will was talking about Will earlier. Just in, in, you were talking about I forgot what you were talking about, and you just briefly mentioned Chavez, and it makes me think, right? And so you just said we all, everybody on the panel knows that. But talk about that a little bit about how you know he's a hero to many, 
but how he had a totally different view of uh, illegal immigration than what is so common and, and, and touchy feeling now, right? He's like the free, yeah. he's like the hero of treating, you know, mil- uh, my, uh, what do you call it? Minorities and migrants and, and workers and the blue, uh, uh, blue collar people fairly, but uh, I don't think he was down for the illegal thing, right? No, he was not. Well, fact. I mean, since oh, our cool. cabinet, yeah, Cesar Chavez used to have fighters with bats and pipes wait in the desert to block illegal migration. And this this really, I think, gets into a difference between kind of first wave and second wave civil rights. Chavez was proud to be Hispanic, but considered himself basically to be an immigrant American working man. In his pitch, he wanted to unionize people that were doing things like picking lettuce, for example. His pitch was that he wanted to be treated as fairly as any other American working man. We can discuss the details, but that was basically it. Just like Martin Luther King's argument as walking as a black minister with a PhD in his suit was, you know, I'm as good as anyone else. I want to be treated like a man. I want the same rights. That that was the argument of Chavez. That was the argument of King. Neither of them, you know, they had some antic personal lives, to be honest, just like Kennedy did. But neither of them had much patience for crime or criminals. So, I mean, I I think that there's a big difference between that. Like, you need to treat me equally. Like, I'm in a suit. I have 50 guys behind me also in suits, but we could fight if need be. Let's talk about the law. There's a difference between that and what we're seeing now, which is sort of, I don't want to be treated as an equal in this society. We need to dramatically change the entire society because it's evil. So, I mean, that, that I think, is where you get some of the modern immigration policy. Who is the West, the wicked West, to say no to the, the hardworking children of toil? So it, it's quite a transition from Chavez to today. Oh, absolutely. And if the West is mean, so wicked, why do you want to come here? Mark, how do we get here? Yeah. Um, Boom. Just I want to make a little plug for Chavez. Um His birthday is March 31st, and I've been on a crusade for the past couple of years to make his birthday National Border Control Day, uh, March 31st. We even have a website, nationalbordercontrolday.com, and every year I write a column about him. You know how you get that done, Mark? You need a T-shirt with he and Shay on it and say, replace him. This is the true hero, right? You need need, need some, some pithy kind of, you know, thing that will reel people in but you you know you, you I gotta think, yeah I, i'll consider that for next spring i keep trying to gin up, logo, gin up some stuff. interest exactly so um anyway uh where what was yeah, your well, question how did we get here we were talking about how we oh. got how did how did the 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 ether you talk about this one world alliance kind of deal but how did we get here how did uh, uh the mindset on immigration change in you know such a short period yeah of time? it's a good question um the it's the what happened was among I mean, there, were, there was always a split among Republicans. So there was regular Republicans who were generally in favor of, you know, of sovereignty and controls. But there was always the business element that wanted, you know, looser borders and ideological libertarians, Cato Institute folks who don't believe in borders. What happened? On, but the left had it used to have its own split like that. There were, you know, hard left people who didn't believe in borders, but there were always pro-union people especially guys like chavez and a lot of uh black leaders in the past guy i mean even as far back as frederick Douglass, up to uh boys uh, randolph yeah, yeah, randolph. Du Bois and washington and, and randolph um who were in favor of limits and even reductions in immigration but what's happened and i don't i mean i can't give you a good explanation it's part of globalization i think is that Unlimited immigration has become an immutable value of the left. It's a litmus test issue now. I wrote a piece on this a number of years ago for National Review. I wanted to call it uh, Open Borders Uber Alice, but uh, the editor thought that was a little too much, so she called it something else. But I gave specific examples of liberal organizations or constituency groups that flipped. For instance, the one that really struck me the most was the ACLU. There was this kind of gadfly activist, uh, pro-control activist in New York, and he had a billboard he put up. A couple of little kids says, immigration will double America's population in my lifetime. This was somewhere in Manhattan. He paid for it. The city government of New York came to the owner of the billboard and said, you're taking that down or we're coming down on you like a ton of bricks. It was a clear-cut, explicit case of government censorship of political speech the guy the activist guy who bought it 
went to the local ACLU and they said, well, you know, yeah, you're right. It is pretty clear cut, but we have a lot of immigrant rights people here. So we're going to have to pass on this. So this is an organization that defended the right of Nazis to wave their filth in the face of Holocaust survivors in Skokie, Illinois, Skokie. that was going to pass on this completely anodyne political message because it contradicted open borders. Um, why this happened? You know, I don't know. Like I said, it's part of globalization. Our elites became disconnected from the interests of Americans. And we saw that in trade policy and I think in foreign policy as well. That's what Trump was a reaction to. Uh, but um, it's it's definitely whatever the cause was, it's a real thing, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Well, you mentioned um, even a lot of um, black leaders used to speak out about that, and I don't usually do shout outs. And here's my second one. So Denise Long sent me this book by Roy Beck. Roy Beck, yeah. About yeah, you should have him on the how, show. Yeah, I should. I should reach out to him. I'm still, I'm halfway through it when I finish. She even looked. She even read it, pre-read it, and told me you need to check these parts out. And, you know, because she is a black anti-racist, right? Yeah. She's a DEI person, and she's trained in all that. Yet she is saying, Charles, you have to read this book about what immigration did to black wealth, right? Yeah. So this is not, like you said, it was not left-right. It's becoming that. That's why I was saying earlier, Shamika, that nobody in the black community is going around talking about what we really need is more people from Guatemala. That will make the country great, right? They're just like, like you say, they're not paying attention to it. But I don't think this is a hot button if, if you get people to, to read and listen and learn. So I don't know how we got here either. It's interesting to hear you talk about that. But I want to see if, if you want to add anything to Shamika before we can get into <laughs> what the specific issues are, you know, policy issues that are causing the problems and, and how we fix them. We got to at least talk about some solutions. But Shamika, anything else you want to add? No, not really. I'm interested in taking a look at that book. Yeah, it's yeah. Back of the Hiring Line. I probably could see it, Back of the Hiring Line. Yep. Right. And we should have Roy on. And his basic point is that immigrant labor made black labor less desirable. In other words, mm -hmm. if employers didn't want to hire blacks for any number of reasons, you know, bad reasons or good reasons, they didn't want to hire them, they could get away with not hiring them because yeah. there was a the constant flow of immigrant labor. And when right. that they used flow to have to, whether they didn't want them or not, they had to hire them because right. we they needed had people, and, and they were the people that were there. Because like Booker T. Washington said in his 1895 Atlanta Exposition speech, calling on industrialists to cast down your bucket where you are and hire black Americans. Well, they weren't going to do that. This was 1895. But they would do it if they didn't have any choice. And when World right. War I cut off the flow, guess what? All, you know, all kinds of people started, uh, industrialists started sending recruiters throughout the South. And they were recruiting white Southerners, too, because, frankly, they weren't all that particularly uh, doing particularly well either. But they were recruiting everybody because they wanted warm bodies. And right. immigration just makes it easy to ignore hiring, to avoid hiring people you don't want to hire for whatever reason. And it's, this is important to me because I'll, I'll send it to you when I'm finishing. I'll, I'll pick it up. But it's also whatever the reasons why, why they did it, because the, the reasons why they did it might not have been for that. But the businessman will say, well, now I don't necessarily have to hire the black, whatever. But maybe the black was doing a good job and we're like, we'll keep the blacks anyway. But then human nature kicked in. So then the immigrants created their own little group and they were like, well, we're going to fight the blacks off the job site. Right. So they were physically attacking them. Right. Saying or creating, you know de facto unions and then eventually unions that they control, right? That's why you have unions that were mostly Polish controlled or the Germans or whatever. So you had these groups and they would lock people out of jobs, right? So even though they brought, they came there for work, right? They didn't come there to, to hate on the black people, but they got the opportunity. And if it's us, or, you know, us or them, we're going to pick us. Yeah, so I even mean, within the country, they were separate. They were creating their own groups and they were protecting their groups. And there was, I remember a few years ago, there was this Latino activist in North Carolina who was complaining because there had been a raid on a factory or something. Chicken factory. Right. And she was, uh, I don't know if this may have been a chick. I don't know if it was a chicken was factory in yeah. this particular instance. But what she said, she actually said this to a reporter. She said, hey, you used to say, uh, you know, why are you, why are you rounding us up and throwing us out? You used to like us. You'd say, hey, you liked us better than the blacks. I mean, literally, that's what she said. It was basically she said the quiet part out loud. Right. Wow. 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 So through the policies, where are they getting it wrong? 
<laughs> everywhere. Where do we start? We have another hour to talk about this. Um, so <clears throat> for, I mean, I don't know, let's, let's start with illegal immigration, with enforcing the laws. Probably the most important thing we're not doing, and this is not a border thing, although it affects the border, is mandatory E-Verify. E-Verify is this online system. It exists now. So when you hire somebody, you take their uh, Social Security and IRS information. You have to do that anyway. This is just a tool to check and make sure it's real, that the number's real, that it matches the name, it matches the date of birth. It exists. About half of new hires are screened through this thing, but it's voluntary. So guess where the illegal immigrants are? They're in the other half. And so it's almost like the lowest hanging fruit, the simplest thing to start doing is to make that part of the hiring process universally. And, you know, no, I mean, Everybody sort of says they're for it, but all of the high immigration people say, let's amnesty everybody who's already here. Let's increase immigration uh, as much as we, you know, we want, and then we'll be for this E-Verify thing. So the first thing is weaken the magnet of jobs that attracts people because that's what they're coming for. Um, the second thing that I, would, that I think is important is ending sanctuary cities, because that can be kind of an applause line for people on the right. But frankly, most illegal immigrants who come to the attention of immigration authorities do that because they commit a crime, not an immigration crime. They beat their wife. They drive drunk. They sell drugs. The cops arrest them and their fingerprints are scanned. Everybody's are. And they all go not just to the FBI now. They also go to Homeland Security. Red flag pops up. The office that does that actually is in Vermont, believe it or not. And they decide, okay, do we have somebody to go pick this guy up? Sanctuary cities mean they refuse to let ICE pick up criminals that they've arrested for other things. Uh, and that has to end. Uh, can, can we pause ahead. on that one for a minute? Sure. Um, I don't know much. I mean, uh, we do have a, a, our house lawyer here in Will. But... I do understand, you know, uh, quite a bit and have a pretty strong sense of common sense. And I wrote a book about the 1619 Project. And so I wrote about every essay. And one of the essays, it was called Undemocratic Democracy. So they try to weave this anti-black racism in America uh, and, and democracy not being real and try to weave today's uh, Republican Party into like John Calhoun and his um, uh, attempts of nullification. It was a even though it was never really, way, but... even though it was never followed through and all that kind of thing, but even, give them their argument. But what struck me and what made me think about what you said is, say so they spin it like you know, it's undemocratic democracy, right? It's not for all the people; it's for certain groups of people. And 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 the Republicans like to gerrymander; and they like to do these things just for their group, as if all politicians don't do it. And they hate the Tenth Amendment, right? Like, how can the states just do whatever they want to do? I say that because one of my arguments arguments is that they all doing it and you only complain when the party you don't like doing it. So they talk about the things the Republicans do it, but sanctuary cities is a great example, right? These places, states in some cases like California, and these big cities are openly saying we're going to defy federal law, openly say, saying it. We're just not going to enforce these federal laws. And if you come, the feds come in and try to enforce the law, we're going to do everything we can to stop you, including judges taking illegals through the back door and running them out to the street so they don't know, like in Oakland. So to, how, is they, how are they getting away with it? Why aren't anybody but the political opposition? Because, of course, if the political opposition is the only one complaining, you're only complaining because you're trying to win you know, political favor. But how, how do they get away with, one, maybe Will can talk about this as well, but how do they get away with talking out of both sides of their mouth and saying democracy is important, we need to be equal and everybody should be equal under the law, yet, and, and, and like bathrooms, right? We're gonna pull all-star games and college NCAA games if you, if you pass a law in your state saying a woman can't go in the men's bathroom, yet I can pass a law in my city saying uh, uh, somebody can be here illegal and shoot three people and you can't put them in jail. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nullification. It's just, I mean, your Calhoun was the right example. This is essentially a nullification principle. That's, um, there's no question about it. <laughs> about it. Will, what do you think about that? 
What do I think about it? I mean, well, again, the thing that comes to my mind with a lot of this is just sort of failure of leadership at the state or the national level. Um, you see this a lot in modern America. It wouldn't be all that difficult to stop a lot of this. Like, I remember in Chicago a couple of years back, we had a parade where the theme was illegal and unafraid. And people were marching through the city with banners that said illegal and unafraid. And you couldn't help thinking that if the governor of Illinois, anyone in a power position had just arrested the first 50 people at the front of the column and said, are you afraid now? <laughs> the whole thing would have never happened again. And I, I mean, I like to some extent, I'm a cocky guy I'm making a joke, but it's also just, there's a very there's a underlying reality there. So with. You see this a lot on the left and the right, actually. The idea of these independent <laughs> jurisdictions taking federalism too far and just knowing that no one's going to challenge them. I mean, like in Colorado, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they basically legalize weed and speed. I think mushrooms, too. Like, you can just go there and buy drugs, and people are. It's kind of like the Amsterdam of the USA, a great place to party, apparently. But if anyone, the president of the United States... A Republican governor of the state wanted to just crack down. There is an underlying set of federal laws that are being violated. And I mean, my, my take is that someone should take action on that until someone does. And I mean, there's obviously a conflict between local municipal ordinance, state law and federal law. But I mean, until someone at the federal boss man level says, no, you can't do that, it's it's going to continue. I mean, yeah, sanctuary... To me, again, I don't, I don't mean to be mocking Mark's analysis on this is very deep. We're, at, we're asking great questions. But a lot of this just seems kind of silly. Like, of course there are solutions to a city that just says we're not going to obey the law. Just like to me, it's kind of an of course know. situation. That although they're, yeah, but I mean, like, it's, most illegal immigrants are hardworking good dudes from the ones I've met. But, like, there's nothing particularly difficult about saying we're going to enforce the immigration law. If you get caught breaking the immigration laws, we're going to throw your ass on a bus with no food and ship you back to the border. No hate, but there's going to be a penalty if, if we don't arrest you and punish you here. So the, the dialogue beyond that about how should different people be treated when they come here illegally and so on, to me, is all a product of the initial failure of leadership. So that's, that's the legal answer. Of course, there are multiple state and federal actions you could take against a sanctuary standalone municipality. Why don't we cowardice in various forms you don't want to you don't want to poke the bear you don't want to waste time on the court case you're afraid of the media that that's what it boils down to yeah i mean it, it, it is it is that but it's more to it because you need for instance if you're going to change statute you need a majority of each house of congress and a president to sign a bill and essentially what we have is the democrats which again used to be more diverse on immigration but now they're not is essentially putting, you know, a veto in effect, not a formal veto, but exercising veto power over any attempt to crack down. Because if you were going to act on, you know, on sanctuary cities, for instance, with, withhold funding from them, well, Congress would have to pass a law to do that. And um, there's when you're split as evenly as you are in Congress now, you can't get a majority that's going to be behind something like that. Well, you may need to do that from a funding standpoint, but you shouldn't need to do that to go in and arrest somebody. No, you shouldn't. That's true. <laughs> that, That's the it, current law. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Well, Tamika, do, do, do you I think mean, that, am I Mark's right? point also is true in a, one of the things here also, that the, the point about the conflict between state, federal, and municipal law is it's a sophisticated, accurate point. But with a lot of this stuff, there's not really a conflict. I mean, people are just breaking the federal law and in some cases the state law. So, I mean, it, it seems like you certainly could go, like if someone just says, hey, speed is legal, amphetamines are legal in this state, or we're not going to enforce the immigration laws in this state. I don't, I mean, I don't have the compiled statutes in front of me, but I don't think it would be especially difficult to punish them for breaking the law. It's just there's there's an incredible reluctance to do that. No one wants to throw the guy at the head of the immigration march in jail. A lot of this is because of the direction of the media. Ninety three percent of the media leans toward the left. You know, what what are you going to look like? Are you going to be presented as Governor Death Santis was? But, you know, X10, that that's the worry when I talk to people in politics anywhere but the solid right. Right. Which is which gives the lie to this idea of living in the shadows. I mean, if you're in the shadows, why are you on the front page of the newspaper and marching, you know, marching down the city streets? Oh, yeah. California named a high school after this illegal guy who was yep. an activist. Yep. Named the schools after him. But, but, but Tamika, I mean, they mostly spoke about whether the federal government 
has the um, the standing to do something about it. But there's also the other piece too, right? That these people are just openly, like I said, thumbing their nose at them. But also the people who are the loudest voices on equality and equity are openly saying, well, we don't really have to treat everybody. We can have certain people with a special status, right? They have special rights that the rest of us don't have. Charles, I, I wish that the federal government would do more. You know, I was just thinking, how would it be if I was president? I would have a firing squad at the at the wall. Um, they wouldn't get past me at all. I'm, I'm t I wouldn't do any outsourcing. Like what, if you're an American company, you would have to hire Americans. I get tired of calling T-Mobile and hearing, welcome to T-Mobile, but may help you. I don't want to hear that. But, but that's want... Kevin from Cleveland though. Did you ever get to <laughs> tell you that? Know. Hey, this, this is Kevin from Cleveland. You ain't in Cleveland. Quit lying. Right. You know, I just think we could definitely do more. And I think we're being very soft on it. And it's it's annoying. It's aggravating to me. And I wish that we would speak louder than those that are speaking loud and saying it's okay. It is not okay. We are crowded. Of course, they are taking the lower paying jobs. And we could definitely do more. I try not to be mean on this show. Oh, but <laughs> Let me just say, let me just say, I'm against firing squads at the border. I need to. I'm already in enough trouble with the Southern Poverty Mark, Law if you Center. Knew how many guests guys. had to clean up I'll take after, all the heat. How many guests had to say, for the record, I do not. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing matches the Kamala Harris one. That that was the greatest Shamika moment. Yeah. What right. was that? That's, that's what it does. People still talk about that. We, but no, but I mean, we like, were all on television with, I think. Brian Kilmeade and uh, someone at Shamika was asked, like, as a, as a fellow black professional woman or something, what do you think about Vice President Kamala Harris? And Shamika said something like, I think she worked hand and knee to get where she is today. <laughs> and it was, it was just a hilarious moment. It went on for a while. Like, there were, like, <laughs> levels of response to the question. <laughs> My yes. hero. So, yeah. so, I, so I don't sometimes, associate myself with any of that either. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So sometimes you have to separate yourself. <laughs> Cross yourself. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But, but you were, I'm sorry, I had to talk about that because it's just so funny that they are just so openly, you know, blatantly saying, hey, we need to do this and while they're doing the exact same thing that evil people on the right, right are doing. But you were given a list okay, of things just, you need yeah, to do. One, e -verify, one last thing, you know, yeah. E-Verify, Sanctuary, Cities. Sanctuary Cities. And the third one, there's a million things, but just these top three things. You know, half of illegal aliens don't sneak across the border. They come in with a they visa, stay. and then they just never leave when their time is supposed to be up. And so what we need is a check-in, check-out system for foreign visitors. We have done we do a lot better on the check-in than we did before 9-11. It actually is pretty good now. But if you don't check people out, you don't know who's still here. And Congress for almost, what is it, 25 years has mandated an electronic check-in, check-out system for foreign visitors, it still doesn't exist. So, you know, those are the top three things uh, on illegal immigration. And I won't go into a whole separate show on legal immigration, but my take on legal immigration very briefly is the world is different. Um, immigrants aren't really all that different from 100 years ago. We are. We're a post-industrial, knowledge-based society. We have a welfare state. Technology shrinks the world. All of that means we need to minimize immigration doesn't mean no immigration it means we keep it we start at zero and then decide which people we're going to let in it's most important to let in i would say that's husbands wives and little kids of american citizens everybody kind of agrees on that as long as it's legitimate real einsteins there's not that many of them in the world and people as far as humanitarian immigration goes people who literally cannot stay where they are one second longer and have nowhere else to go and there's not that many people like that. The UN actually keeps a list of emergency refugee cases, and there's like seven or eight thousand, ten thousand a year. That's it. So you put all that together, I would be for a legal immigration level of let's say four hundred thousand a year. It's still more than any other country takes for legal immigration, but it's you know sixty, seventy percent less than we're taking now. So that's my. I got a whole twenty minute speech on that, but that's my two minute version of it. Well, I got to apologize in advance for doing this. Usually, I, I time it just right that we end up with, what are the solutions? You talk about them and we say, thank you and, and good night. Because I don't like to end on a somber thing. 
but now I have to because it's the only <laughs> thing I have left. So you say immigration has been bad for decades. You say Biden's making it worse. Well, he's not done yet. So do a little prognosticating and tell me how much worse is he going to make it before the next election? What more damages do you see? What do you see happening over? You say it's going to be back in the news soon. So in the next year, what happens other than just more people coming? But Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the more people coming. But the one I would say maybe the worst thing I'm afraid of is they have a new rule in the pipeline for how to give asylum out. And they're going to give asylum. That's their solution to the border, is they're going to rubber stamp everybody there. Oh, Oprah. They're going to be uh, like Oprah giving away cars. Exactly. Only it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be, you get a car, you get asylum, you get asylum, you get asylum. And then they're going to say, look, we solved the border problem. They're all legal. What's your problem? Um, that's what I'm really afraid of, is they're going to use asylum even more as a way, a kind of a crowbar to pry open the borders of the country, just like you're seeing in Europe, because all of their problems on immigration are driven by this asylum policy, which dates from the immediate aftermath of World War II. It's a Cold War, post World War II policy. This is this, you can't start. I mean, I you know that's a whole separate show, but we need to get rid of this idea or fundamentally change this idea of asylum because it's used as a way of negating the whole rest of immigration policy. And I'm afraid Biden's going to take a big step in that direction if they implement these new asylum rules. Well, this has been a great conversation. He is Mark Gregorian, national champion, winning women's soccer coach. Oh, no, that's, that's not wrong me. One. Wrong one. Wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. I mean, you think the name would be unique enough you would find No, no, no. There's a lot of them. Throw a little soccer dig in there. But, uh, you know, executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. Mark, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, yes. I got a country to save cause I'm Patriot J and I'm saving a day.